Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, very, very briefly, Maggie and I are kind of long-term residents of Nashua. We lived here for a long time. And about four years ago, we moved back uh, full-time. Our children are back here. But in between, for uh, kind of weird reasons I won't go into, we decided to buy a home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Very interesting place to be. And while we were there, I signed up for a very intensive docent training program to, to lead tours and do educational work at the uh, state-sponsored Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, which is a, a wonderful Native American museum, and at another in institution that has, uh, in particular, a large collection of Pueblo Indian pottery, among other Native artwork uh, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. <clears throat> this one photo will give you just a taste of the amazing variety in terms of cultural differences, material differences, design differences uh, that give this work and have for hundreds of years um, a wonderful, wonderful, fascinating variety. Um, first, a little background. I hope that none of you are in the position of being confused about whether New Mexico is in fact a state in the United States of America. Um, some people are. New Mexico, like most states, has a state magazine, which, you know, color, kind of color photo magazine, which I would recommend if you have any interest in uh, finding out a little bit about what goes on there. Um, and it has a humor, mag uh, humor column, like all these magazines do. And the humor column of New Mexico Magazine is devoted exclusively to funny, supposedly true stories about people who dealt with situations where people didn't realize that this was part of the United States. You know, are we going to have to do a currency exchange here? Do you need a visa? Oh, I'm sorry, we can't send that package because we don't ship internationally, that kind of thing. Um, New Mexico is forgotten about a lot, but it's that great big squarish state in between Arizona and Texas. Um, and it has a really remarkable culture as well as fantastic scenery that makes it uh, well worth a visit and well worth living there for many years. Uh, the other thing people get confused about is it gets cold there. We would come back at Christmas to visit our children and we'd be flying back uh, out there and people would say, oh, you're going back to Arizona to warm up. And we'd have to say first, well, no, it's New Mexico, not Arizona. It's not the same. And yes, it gets cold there because Santa Fe is at 7,000 feet. It's got fully 2,000 feet on the you know, famous mile high city of Denver. It's the highest state capital in the country. Uh, so it has a real winter out there, not usually a lot of snow. Um, but there is a, a beautiful, uh, fairly uh, respectable ski area right straight uphill from the city that goes up to 11 and 12,000 feet. And I've skied down that trail probably about a thousand times in, uh, in 15 years. 
but it's a marvelous place to be all year round. There's a lot going on. The biggest event of the entire year, I think it's fair to say, is Indian Market, when hundreds of native artists from all over the country come to Santa Fe, bring the, the things that they've created, and tens of thousands of people show up to, uh, to see and to collect. It's a major, really fascinating event. And on top of that, all year long, every day, uh, you will find native artists sitting under the portal of the Palace of the Governors, which is the historical capital building. Santa Fe has been the capital of Santa F uh, of well, of what's now New Mexico for 400 years, since long before it was part of the United States, long before the United States existed, long before even New Mexico as a territory existed, uh, it's been the, the capital. So it's uh, one of the fascinating things about it. And you'll find native people under this uh, portal every day of the year in all kinds of weather uh, with pottery and jewelry and a lot of other things that uh, can be wonderful to look at. And Collect, of course. Um, so how did we come here? Uh, Coronado led the first major Spanish expedition up into the Southwest uh, in 1540, brought a ton of people and cattle and everything else with him, not looking to settle permanently, but looking largely for gold and silver, which they didn't find much of because, as you may no, there's not much gold and silver out in most parts of, of uh, that part of the country. And so after a couple of years, they went back to Mexico and didn't come back en masse for quite a, quite a while long uh, after that. But what they did encounter on their journeys was groups of native people li uh, living in very tight-knit agricultural communities with uh, multi-story adobe architecture like this that I'm sure you've seen pictures of if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to visit out there. And uh, because they were so distinctive in their architecture and in their lifestyle, the Spanish referred to them as Pueblo, which of course is the Spanish name for a town or community. And although they called themselves many different things at the time, of course, they have accepted to this day Pueblo as a kind of group designation for the cultures of, of this part of the country. So in spite of all the predations that native people uh, suffered out there as they did elsewhere in the country, uh, the, the Pueblo people were able to maintain possession of at least a portion of their traditional lands. And today there are 19 established Pueblo communities in New Mexico and one in in Arizona, actually, so the, the talk is a bit about New Mexico and Arizona. Thank you. I, I, you're, vindic you're vindicated. I'm vindicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are small native uh, nations, in effect. They have uh, local governments and jurisdiction over some portion of their own affairs. They work very hard to keep their uh, native languages alive, even in the face of you know television and, and everything else in the modern world. Um, they speak about half a dozen different old ancient languages in their communities. And they have, uh, although they have a lot in common, uh, being in this part of the country together, or in the same general area at least, uh, there are cultural differences that are part of what makes the art that they create endlessly fascinating. Looking back, we could go back 10,000 years, of course. Some of you may have heard the word maybe possibly in one of Michelle's talks at some point. Uh, about Clovis. Uh, Clovis is actually a tiny town in north in south eastern New Mexico where some of the earliest native uh, artifacts, arrowheads and stuff were found that were dated back to about 10,000 years and then they pushed the, the date back to 12,000 years ago and there's now a lot of controversy about how long before that some people might have uh, been here however they, uh, however they came. But we can certainly trace a very active history back easily a thousand years. Uh, the Chaco area in the northwestern part of the state is in this beautiful region. This is uh, actually a, a modern photograph of Chaco Canyon. You can see the canyon. Uh, but superimposed on that is an artist's rendition, a completion, if you will, 
of the, uh, what's now the, the major ruins of the largest of the Pueblo community complexes there that uh, people today call Pueblo Bonito. But even today, there are just amazing portions of it that are still standing, uh, like this amazing, uh, try, try building a dry stone wall like that and have it stand up for a thousand years. It's uh, really uh, an amazing place to go visit a major attraction and a, a, a national monument. Here you'll find, uh, um, what well, you won't find anymore, but certainly archeologists have found and collected uh, pottery like some of these examples with distinctive cross-hatched designs on them and very familiar use cases like the mug on the, or pitcher on the left. Um, they also made a lot of um, pottery that uh, has this kind of patterning on it that might have been done with a thumb or with an implement that could have made it a good cooking vessel because it would uh, transmit the heat well and it would be relatively easy to pick up without it slipping out of your hands. Um, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to visit Mesa Verde National Park. Somebody, I see some hands in south, uh, southwestern Colorado, another uh, fantastic site, which is actually basically where many of the people from the Chaco area who lived uh, uh, in, the, in the canyon that I just showed you from maybe roughly 800 to 1100 AD, uh, after drought and combat and whatever else might have happened, uh, chased them out of that area. Uh, a lot of those people moved up to Mesa Verde and built these fantastic stone structures there in the cliff sides that are still there for, uh, for people to be able to, to visit and enjoy. And again, here are some typical mugs with designs that come from the Mesa Verde area. Mugs that uh, look at pretty much like the ones you, that you might find on your kitchen counter, but with just fantastic designs on them that uh, are exciting to see to this day. Down, this, is, this isn't a very good map, but down in the southern part of New Mexico, um, there was a culture that we call the Mimbres, which is simply the name that the Spanish centuries later gave to uh, the principal river that flows through there. Um, the Mimbres also were living down there in the neighborhood of uh, 900 or so years ago. And they developed an amazing artistic tradition where the most typical element is taking a deep, it's a little hard to see from these pictures because they're taken from directly above. But these are very deep serving bowls that uh, have been painted with the most amazing design. Some of them are depictions of, let's say, native people that give us an idea of what people might have dressed like in their hunting. Uh, some of them are animals. Uh, some of them are just fantastic composite creatures. Some of them are just, again, amazing um, geometric designs. And all painted, of course, on the curved interior of a piece of pottery. Here's an, an, uh, an example of uh, what we would call polychrome, which simply means that it's been painted in multiple colors. They would have painted their pottery with uh, natural mineral elements that they uh, worked with and mined themselves. Here's another example. So let's take a look at some of the uh, distinctive kinds of pottery that have come and come today from different, uh, different parts of the state. First, we'll start out at Acoma Pueblo, west of Albuquerque. Acoma is most famous for this ancient village that sits on a mesa uh, on the, uh, in the Pueblo that they call Sky City. It is supposedly the oldest continually inhabited community in the nation. People still live up there, or they have a second sort of ceremonial home up there. And they're like everywhere else in the Pueblos. People go out and very ceremonially mine their own clay, dig it up from a known sacred uh, clay source in the Pueblo, carry it back home. You can see who's doing the work here, but the man has the, the job of, of carrying the bundles home. 
Uh, today, they might show up with a pickup truck and empty five gallon joint compound buckets and pick it all up, but nonetheless, it's processed still pretty much the same way today. Broken up, washed, rinsed, filtered, until they wind up with clay that looks pretty much like what a potter might show up, uh, might be able to get it in, in a store today. But all done by hand. This series of photographs uh, gives you a little bit of an idea of how the pottery is actually formed. They don't throw pots on a wheel. Uh, it's all done, all the shape, all the, the proportion and the roundness of it is all done by eye. Uh, you start out by simply taking a blob of clay and putting a thumb hole in it and beginning to, to make a shape and then putting that inside a, a shell that could be a dish or it could be like you see in the photo here, a piece of a broken old pot in order to shape the bottom of it uh, in a container that they, uh, some people call a pookie to get started. And then after that, the potter will make kind of uh, snaky coils like you might have made with uh, Play-Doh back, uh, back in school and then flatten those out and one by one layer those around the edge of the top of what you're working with in order to extend the pot one piece at a time using a, a piece of wood or an antelope bone or something like that. The shaping process continues and then you add layer after layer of clay to the top, shaping it as you go in order to get the, the, the piece that you're, uh, that you're aiming for. This is uh, a guy named Franklin Peters, from uh, a potter from Acoma Pueblo, who uh, I was able to film in one of the um, pottery galleries in Santa Fe. And here he is making use of an ancient tool that you might recognize as the bottom of a sardine can that he decided was just the perfect tool for smoothing out the outside surface of the pot. And then he's just using a smooth river stone to polish the outside of the pot. There's no glaze, no other artificial coating to give the shininess of the outside of the pot. It's uh, all done simply by hand polishing the, uh, the clay itself. And then to that, just as a, a, a potter you might be familiar with would do, he then puts a thin layer of a clay mixture that's called slip uh, as the outer surface of the pot in order to give it the final finish that can be smoothed out and uh, uh, a design painted on. Here we can see Franklin actually mixing his own color here. He's got uh, a clump of something in the way of an iron compound that he's mixing with water and simply scraping it around in order to make a paint to use for the, the decoration of the, uh, the pot that he's working on. And when that's done, that dries to a kind of grayish color in this case, as you can see, he starts the design. The design is uh, improvised. It could incorporate oh, some traditional symbols. It might simply be his own design ideas. It could be really anything that he wants, uh, wants it to be at all. All laid out by eye. And then he makes a paintbrush from a strand of Yucca. Yucca is that southwestern plant that has the long, skinny, pointy leaves. And if you break those leaves open or chew one open at the base, it reveals a bundle of very strong fibers. And you can expose just the right number of fibers you want to make a paintbrush of any width that, as you can see, has exactly the right uh, flexibility to be able to paint on this curved surface. See how easy that is? <laughs> so that's the completed pot before it's fired. 
and then a similar one after it's fired. So the brown paint was charred black, but just because of the, the chemical nature of the slip that he put in, that fires to, uh, in this case, a, a pretty much a high white color. Uh, pottery still is generally fired in uh, the same kinds of uh, simple outdoor fires that uh, fire pits that they have used for centuries, and I'll try to, to make sure I have time to show you a video of that at the, at the end of the presentation. Uh, some people do kiln fire, especially this relatively delicate, white, thin-walled pottery that's typical of Acoma. Um, and that's something that would be revealed to a collector, and that's okay with, with some people, although, of course, uh, collectors put a value on the people using the traditional methods, just as the potters themselves put, uh, put great value in, in those methods. So here's another example of uh, a piece that comes from Acoma. Clearly, in recent decades, as uh, people have gotten much more, potters have gotten much more savvy about the whole nature of collecting, because this, this is a, a wonderful tradition, it has great cultural value, but nonetheless, people today are making high design pottery like this. Obviously, they're, they're creating this for an art market and they're making a living at it, and so it's, uh, it gives them an incentive to use their imagination to create pieces that are going to appeal to, uh, to collectors. What would something like that cost? But probably uh, some, something in four figures. Here's an, another lovely example. Again, if you think this design looks tricky, try imagine creating it on a curved surface. Also, uh, Acoma is well known for its polychrome pottery, in particular featuring the Acoma parrot. It's a very traditional shape that you can immediately recognize. Um, in a pot like this one that's been created with a couple of different colors on it. So let's move on to a different part of the, uh, the Pueblo communities. Um, and we'll take a look at Cocha tea. On one side of the Rio Grande River in between Albuquerque and Santa Fe, and more or less right across the river, Santa Domingo Pueblo. These two Pueblos have a lot in common. They speak the same native language. They have a lot of the same ceremonial values, and a pot like this might be very typical of either place. They make a lot of pottery that has this kind of design of very strong um, markings, like the black lines that draw your eye into the empty space in between the lines. Here's a picture of Robert Tenorio, who's one of the masters of Santo Domingo pottery with uh, one of his pots that has very traditional designs on it. And here's another plate that he's made decorated with images of birds. And you might look at this and say, oh, that's a lovely design. But what you need to understand is that at Santa Domingo, they are traditionally very hesitant to let people portray even images of animals in things that they create. And certainly realistic images of people would be absolutely forbidden. So Robert is somewhat pushing the envelope here when he creates a piece like this. And it's not like an artist in New York who's pushing the envelope and trying to do something uh, different from what's been done before. He could genuinely get in trouble with the Pueblo uh, governorship if he creates pieces that are too much out of line with what the, uh, what the longstanding traditions dictate. So it's something he has to be, has to be careful about. So here's another piece. I think this one actually comes from Cochiti. And as you can see, it looks very much with the black designs that sort of draw your eye into the empty space in between. Uh, looks very much like the, the first older pot that we saw. These older pieces are probably in the order of 120, uh, 140 years old, you know, mostly somewhere between, let's say, 1880 and, and 1920, typically because that's about the time period when archaeologists and other academics started going out there and actively collecting pieces like this for museums. But here at Cochiti, they have no problem depicting, depicting people. They have made what we call effigy figures like this uh, clownish one for uh, at least a couple of centuries, a lot of them making fun of uh, 
what I'll just call Anglo visitors, and in New Mexico, if you're not, if you're not an Indian, you're not Hispanic, you're, you're Anglo. You could be Japanese, it doesn't matter. You're an Anglo in, in New Mexico. Uh, this one looks like a, it could be, uh, not sure, an opera singer. The opera train would go by on its way and uh, they would get the, to see people get off. The circus train would go by. They loved to make fun of the Catholic priests uh, who were otherwise tormenting them to a great extent. So they made these very funny figures and still do that are a longstanding, uh, very collectible tradition. Here's a duck pot, a pot actually in the shape of a duck. That's another very traditional uh, kind of cochety design. Very different from what you would see right across the river at Santa Domingo. Another recent tradition is uh, this wonderful one of a storyteller. The story goes that there was a, a potter named Helen Cordero who uh, I guess didn't feel as though she had great skill at creating perfectly round uh, decorative you know, water pots or whatever. And so she started making figures, storyteller figures. And a very famous designer named Alexander Girard, who had a great deal to do with the founding of the Folk Art Museum, that's another of the major museums out there, uh, looked at her and said, you know, if you took that, that uh, singing figure and maybe put some children on it, you might have something that would be attractive to collectors. And uh, boy, did he hit on something because she turned it into a, a major um, new type of figure for collectors. Again, this is not a tradition that goes back hundreds of years. It's a tradition that was developed uh, perhaps in something like 1950, but it's become a, a major creative uh, effort and a major source of uh, collectors. Uh, of course, you can get into competition for how many, how many different figures you can cram onto the storyteller before it all falls apart. And again, here there are uh, whimsical examples of as well that people have, uh, have created as a change of pace. Also at Cochiti, this is a photo of Diego Romero, who's a Cochiti potter. He's got an interesting story. He and his brother Mateo, who became a very successful painter, were actually born and raised in Berkeley, California. Their father was from Cochiti. He was an artist himself. But he was in the Korean War, and he was seriously injured. Um, I think, it, actually, he lost the use of one of his hands, which is, of course, tragic as an artist. And I guess when he was convalescing in Berkeley, he met up with a, um, this would have been, you know, 1970-ish. Um, he met up with a um, lovely, blonde, blue-eyed Berkeley girl who probably thought it was way cool to be dating an Indian. And they got married, and Diego and his brother were born there, lived their lives there, but were always attracted to the community that their father had come from. And both moved back to New Mexico and really absorbed uh, a, a lot of the native, authentic Southwestern, Southwestern culture. But at the same time, in his work, Diego took elements of those Mimbres bowls that I showed you, the deep bowls that have the often uh, wild geometric designs in them, and use them to tell stories of all kinds. He was attracted to classic comics, like the G.I. Joe comics and the Marvel uh, superhero comics, as a, and, and the people who had drawn the images for those, and uses that kind of style in his own work to do a lot of, in some cases whimsical, some cases very serious, commentary. Here he's clearly got a picture representing something about the evils of industry in his pot. Here is one even more gruesomely depicting an episode in which a number of uh, native men were um, tortured by having one foot chopped off for trying to organize an uprising against the Spanish back in the, the days of the Spanish occupation. Uh, but he also has quite a sense of humor as well. So we can see a a, a, mimbrous, a mimbrous golfer in this one. <laughs> Further north, we can take a look at Santa Clara and San Ildefonso Pueblos. They've been famous for centuries for their plain black pottery. 
It also tends to be rather massive looking. Uh, and it's not just a matter of style, but the clay up there is very different than it is in other places. And so they have to mix it with a considerable amount of river sand or tuff, which is the soft rock that comes out of the volcano that uh, blew up there about a million years ago. And so they uh, have been famous for creating black pottery. And I'll talk to you a little bit at the end about just how that is done, because the natural clay that they use is actually red. So here's a piece that takes advantage of the thickness of the pot to be able to do some deep incising. This one shows the Avanyu figure, which is a water serpent. You can see the forked tongue coming out of the serpent's mouth here. And here is a, obviously a very old picture of a traditional pottery firing which, uh, I'll, again, I will uh, show you some pictures of some video of at the, at the end of the presentation. Here's a more modern image of a potter named Nathan Youngblood, who's quite well known, but creates contemporary, but still, in a way, very traditional pots. And as you can see in this photo, fires them in an outdoor fire in the same way that has been done for, for hundreds of years. And here's an example of his work. So you can see the direct connection with the older pieces that are beautiful, but not quite so exquisitely uh, finished. And uh, this is the pot that he did that's uh, typical of his uh, very, very remarkable work. Somebody was asking about Price. Maggie could tell the story of he was collaborating with a glass artist from the, the Northwest, from the Washington area. Uh, where basically I think he would design a piece in clay and then it would be executed in glass. And Maggie attempted a, a, attended a presentation where they were showing their pieces and passing around sort of a glass version of a pot like this around the audience. And somebody said, uh, so how, how much will this cost in the gallery? And Nathan said, oh, about $25,000. And the, the, per, the person who was holding it fortunately didn't drop it on the floor. But you, you have to understand that, especially when you're talking about name artists, this is, this is uh, taken, taken seriously as, as serious artwork. Here is, uh, again, a, a similar rather simple pot, but a lovely one showing more the, the natural red color of the clay. And, I, and again, I will talk to you. Uh, show you in a moment how red turns to black. Uh, Tammy Garcia is one of the true superstars of, uh, of the pottery world. So again, she's taken this very traditional technique of doing deep incising in pots and applied her own uh, wonderful design sense, artistic sense, and color sense to a pot like this over, uh, over on the right. We visited her in her home once on a museum tour. And she had an enormous version of a pot like this, maybe two feet high, that was in process sitting in the middle of the dining room table where her kids do, do their homework. And we were touring the house. And uh, I think Maggie was talking to her husband, who owned the gallery where her work was displayed. And uh, Maggie was talking about this because she had branched out into doing glass work and bronze. She's a very ambitious artist. And Maggie commented on her doing this fairly traditional piece. And he said, yes, that's a commission, actually. That's why she's doing it. Uh, that's going to sell for $150,000. So, <laughs> Probably the most famous of all of the Southwestern potters was Maria Martinez from San Ildefonso. This is one of the rare instances where women actually get the majority of the credit uh, because she worked in tandem with her very talented artist husband, Julian. She had this fantastic gift just for creating just perfect shapes, but very simple pots like the black one on the left. And he may have looked at this and thought, well, how am I supposed to decorate this? It's a plain black pot. And so over a period of a few years, they came up with the idea of creating this two-tone style, like what you see on the right that today we call black on black, where she would 
completely polish the pot shiny with a river stone like you saw Franklin Peters doing in the video. And then he would come along after that and have to paint with a kind of gritty clay mixture the rough, what had to be the background, the reverse of the design that he wanted behind the Avanyu uh, river serpent figure like you see here. And that became their trademark and is still made by many, many potters in San Ildefonso uh, and elsewhere still today. But they also did a lot of spectacular polychrome work. He worked uh, for some years as a laborer on archaeological digs. And so he would pick up pottery shards that uh, came from all over and had lots of different kinds of designs on them and had a wonderful eye for being, at a, to, uh, being able to combine those into design patterns like the fantastic ones on these pieces. And now we'll move up to the north and Taos, Picaris, and Nambe Pueblos. And there's a lot of, I told you that the, the clay is one of the distinctive features that varies from, from place to place. And uh, up there, there's a lot of micaceous clay, so clay that has silicate material in it. It was great for making cooking pots. I guess the pots, the silicate material transfers the heat well. But a lot of people thought, oh, you, you can't make decorative pottery with that It's because it's shiny. What could you do with it? And then this guy came along named Lonnie Vigil. Lonnie uh, had a job with the BIA back in Washington and decided that wasn't the life for him and went back to New Mexico and taught himself basically recre recreating the uh, techniques that his grandmother had used to make pottery. And uh, began to make absolutely fantastic, very artistic pottery from micaceous clay. Uh, this is one of his largest pieces. You can try to imagine for a moment the process I showed you before of putting one layer of clay above another and try to figure out how you would get all the way up to the top of that pot without the whole thing falling in. But it's an amazing, uh, an amazing sense of uh, timing as much as anything else to be able to pull that off. Um, one of the things that ha can happen in a natural firing is these scorch marks that some people might consider flaws on the, on the pot. But Lonnie, in a brilliant uh, touch of perhaps native marketing, said, oh no, those aren't flaws. Those are fire clouds. They're an essential part of the design of the piece. And in a way, it works out that way because you create what might be a very simple but very uh, elegant, round, perfect design. And then the marks that come from the fire are unpredictable and really complemented in a wonderful way. Here's just another example of the kind of imaginative work that he does that might not have much of any connection to traditional pieces. But uh, nonetheless, it's a, it's a work of art. And finally, vindicating Michelle's mention of, uh, of Arizona. There is one of the Pueblos which is in Arizona, and it's the Hopi people who are uh, somewhat awkwardly in, right in the middle of the enormous Navajo Nation. And out there, uh, back in the, maybe the 1880s, there was a woman who goes by the name of Nampeo, who's pictured here, who was working I think in support of a, an archaeology dig, she might have been preparing food for the workers. And she was picking up pottery shards from cultures that were in the vicinity of where she lived, but that had died out over time. And she was fascinated by these designs and went home and began to recreate them and created a, a fantastic whole new branch of uh, Pueblo pottery. The clay there is distinctive in that without putting any kind of a slip on it, it fires to this beautiful burnished kind of yellowish orange color that's completely distinctive. And then on top of that, you have the brilliant painted designs that she pulled together from all of these different uh, pottery shards that she dug up out of the ground. She has a lot of descendants. I think all Hopi potters claim to be descended from Nampeo to these days. It uh, adds a certain cachet to their work. But these are the uh, Sami sisters 
who I think are actually descendants of uh, Nampeo, who, as you can see here, are carrying on the traditions that she started well over 100 years ago with uh, beautiful contemporary pieces. And the Navajo people themselves are not particularly well known for their pottery, but there is something of a tradition of creating a pottery that actually does have a pitch glaze on it, so it polishes to a very high shine. And I think that glaze also makes us susceptible to uh, the kind of scorching that can happen in the firing process. And so it becomes very characteristic to have this uh, kind of high orange, high polish orange color with lots of scorch marks on it is really typical and characteristic of uh, the Navajo pottery. Uh, this is a potter with the wonderful name of Samuel Many Mules, who is uh, one of the best known Navajo potters. And you will see work like this. Here are another, kind of, uh, another couple of beautiful examples. Very simple shapes, but just executed with perfection. So I'm going to take, I'm glad I left a little time for it, because I want to take a few minutes now and show you a video of a traditional pottery firing. So this is two potters at uh, San Ildefonso, Russell Sanchez and Martha Appleleaf Fender. And again, you can see the uh, miscellaneous metal debris, cafeteria trays, milk crates, whatever else they can find. And look, notice that the pots they're putting on the fire have a bright red glaze on them. And I told you that the clay in this part of the uh, Pueblos has a natural red color. Uh, the Fuel for the fire is often principally dried sheep dung. It burns very hot, I guess, and also it doesn't have any kind of pitch or resin in it that would scorch the pottery. A little cornmeal spread on the fire as a prayer. Are we getting sheep, sheep dung humor here? <laughs> It's fun. Once it dries out, it's, you wouldn't even know where it comes from. The whole process I'm showing you here takes, oh, a couple of hours, not a huge long time. Sprinkling in little bits of additional wood to try to make the fire at first as hot as possible. Well, you might suggest that. <laughs> Try not to get burned. Oops. So here comes the magic part. After it's been going for about an hour, they take more humor possibility here, powdered horse manure, and completely bury the fire. This is a technique that has been used in Santa Clara and San Ildefonso for hundreds of years. And worldwide, it's probably been used for thousands of years. I think I've seen Egyptian pottery that looked like it was made the same way. Burying the fire like this smothers it and robs it of oxygen while the fire inside is still very hot. And that causes a different chemical process to happen, that rather than oxidizing the natural red, whatever the red minerals are in the clay, it turns the pottery black. And this is how, as in the pieces that I showed you earlier, potters at Santa Clara and San Ildefonso have been making black pottery from red clay for hundreds of years. Isn't that amazing? Would you pick that up on a stick? <laughs> Considering.
Oh, just talking to people. <laughs> I mean, actually, I was taking a lot of video. I, I just edited this uh, four-minute piece out of all of it. I'm sorry? Oh, they would certainly reuse the metal, yes. They have to go to a stable and get a few more <laughs> bins of uh, horse manure and go out in the fields and pick up some sheep dung. But no, I'm sure all of the, the, the little bits of metal trays and so forth that they use are reusable. And just like a fine piece of um, crystal, if the piece has a nice ring to it, it means it came out well fired. So thank you very much. I hope that was interesting.